Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Andy. Uh, I'm the tech director and a worship leader here at The Bridge, uh, and I'm just so thankful uh, this morning for the chance to be able to share with you, to look to God's Word together, uh, and just continue in our series in Acts. As I was thinking about this message uh, leading up to today, uh, I remembered a movie that I just watched recently that kind of uh, spoke to some of the things uh, that I want to speak to today. It's a movie that just came out. It's called Worth. And it's a movie based on the true story of Kenneth Feinberg, the attorney who was given the task of handling the September 11th compensation fund, victim cup compensation fund. Basically, what this meant was Feinberg was leading a team that would have to create a formula to compensate uh, people who were victims during the uh, September 11th uh, attacks. Uh, if they were injured or uh, they had loved ones who were lost that day. Obviously, this guy was not in a very enviable position. It's not a job I would want to have. The movie begins uh, by introducing us to Feinberg, teaching a university class about the nature of a job like this. Uh, and they kind of do that classic trope where uh, they introduce us to this guy as he's writing something on the chalkboard. You know, we've all seen movies like that. But it introduces us to this man uh, as he writes up on the board a question for his class. He asks them, what is life worth? It's a pretty effective and thought-provoking intro. Uh, it, how does one go about assigning a dollar amount to something like life? But of course, Feinberg tells the class, you know, this isn't a philosophy class. And in the eyes of the law, there is like it an actual answer, and you guys are uh, here to calculate that. That's what the job is. Now, I am no university professor. I'm just a guy who's really excited to talk with you about Jesus and the Bible this morning. But if I was to start off today's message in kind of that similar classic chalkboard trope way, I would ask a similar question to the one that he asked his class, but I would change it just a little bit. What I would write up here is, where do we find true worth? If we're honest, I bet we'd all like to uh, say the Sunday school answer, you know, Jesus, the gospel, God, the one who created us, who, who gives everything meaning. But today's text in Acts chapter 4 will confront us with the fact that while saying that is a great start, it's true. Our actions speak louder than our words. How we live declares what we value. And the ways we assign value will inevitably create an economy around them, a system that reflects what we believe regardless of what we may or may not say. We're going to find in these verses an amazing example of the early believers' faith on display through their actions. We'll see a community so radically changed by the gospel that their ideas of worth were turned upside down. The economy among these believers declared loudly what they believed true worth to be found in. Would you join me in prayer before we look to today's scripture passage? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity together to learn from you today. And Lord, I pray that you would give us understanding, but more than that, as we look to your word, we pray that you would shape us more clearly into people who reflect your love to others today. Lord, I pray that by the, t the end of our time together, that we would be people who are yearning to grow closer to you, that we would have grown closer to you even in the space of this morning. Lord, we love you. We look to you in all these things. Pray these things in your name. Amen. So this morning, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4. If you have your Bible or any way to access the Bible, uh, you can go ahead and turn there. I know uh, the last couple of weeks, we've covered a ton of ground. Uh, two weeks ago, Todd preached through the entire chapter 3 of Acts. Uh, and then last week, he did most of chapter 4. And today, I get to come in and just talk about the last six verses of chapter 4. Uh, just kind of slowing it down and just seeing... Uh, what Luke, the author of Acts, has for us here in these last few verses at the end of the chapter. Uh, 
So starting in verse 32 of chapter 4, it says this. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, to begin, I hope we can all just see right off the bat how amazingly positive this passage is. Luke seems to only have good things to say about the community here. They are wonderfully united of one heart and soul, making sure that everyone in their midst is taken care of. Doesn't that sound like a community you would want to be a part of? Isn't that the sort of community we, we long to be a part of, that we long to create for others, where, where everyone feels like they are taken care of? Luke describes everything in such a way that it almost feels utopian, and his word choice certainly suggests that this new community has captured some of God's heart for his people. And if we take a step back from this passage and just consider the larger context of where it falls even in the Bible, we'll see pretty quickly why that is pretty significant. Sometimes when we focus so deeply on just a few verses at a time, we can kind of forget about where it falls in that grand story of Scripture. And I want to just remind us of that this morning. And you'll excuse me because I'm halfway through a seminary course right now on the Old Testament, so I have to point to where this connects to that. Uh, and I'm really excited to show that to you this morning. But the story of the Bible shows us God's heart for his people, his heart to dwell with us, to redeem us, to sanctify us. In the Old Testament, God chose Israel to be the people through whom he would make himself known. And one way that God revealed his heart to Israel was by giving them instructions on how they were to live together and how to lead lives that were set apart. One of the marks of God's people can be found in Deuteronomy 15.4, which says that, among other things, when the nation of Israel moved into the promised land, there were to be no poor among them. If this community was to flourish, to bless the nations, and to embody God's heart, they were to take care of the poor in their midst. That was to be one aspect of uh, God's plan for his people as they moved into the promised land. So if we fast forward now to Acts chapter 4 with this new community and this new covenant, this is the second time that Luke has paused the narrative to kind of zoom out and show us uh, what the community was like at this point. And so this is the second time he's done this. He's mentioned that everything uh, is in common among these believers. But this time he adds the phrase that we see in verse 34. There was not a needy person among them. It seems that Luke is implying that this new community formed around Jesus as their Messiah King is the community that God was choosing to work through to continue his work of blessing the nations and now inviting them into the kingdom of God. In Deuteronomy, the nation of Israel was told how to embody God's intentions for his people to live together. In Acts, Luke describes this new community as carrying out that intention. This story is here to show us not only that things were going really well, but to also communicate that this community was pursuing God's heart together. There were miraculous things happening all around them. We've already seen that a little bit in Acts. But one of the miracles that can often be overlooked is that this community was just thriving remarkably together, supporting one another. And the care they had for one another reflected what they valued. If you're following along with uh, notes this morning, the first point I have for us today 
is that the believers valued one another over their possessions. We see this in verse 32 right away. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. As Luke takes a step back from the narrative to uh, give us a summary of how the believers are doing at this point, look at the words that he uses. The full number were of one heart and soul. In other words, the early community of the church was miraculously united. An image that we get throughout the New Testament is that we are to be united as the church, that we are to be a body made up of many parts to form a collective whole. As believers in Christ, we're united by something that transcends time and place. What a beautiful image we see in this early group of Jesus followers, that they were knit together so closely that Luke says they basically shared one heart. They had one soul together. When I picture these early believers, an image that comes to mind uh, is a concert that I went to when I was in high school. Uh, The band that uh, I went to see with my brother uh, was this group that I had uh, found like entirely on YouTube by accident. Um, And I fell in love with their music. I listened to every album of theirs. They became one of my favorite groups. But none of my friends had ever heard of them because I just kind of randomly stumbled upon them. So it became this thing that for me felt like it was unique to just me. It was a special thing for me to listen to this band uh, by myself even, to just uh, enjoy their music, and it was all for me. But seeing them in concert was an eye-opening experience and completely different. I went from listening to this band all by myself to suddenly being filled, or in a theater filled with people singing the same words that I had fallen in love with, that I enjoyed so much. It was one of the most uh, memorable moments I've had at a concert, and I've been to quite a few. I suddenly felt this profound connection to all these people, you know, just because they had all discovered this band just like me, and we were all singing the same songs together. How much deeper, though, is the connection that we all have who know Christ as our Savior? When we link arms because of the gospel, that is an incomprehensibly deeper bond than any song could create. Does the way we live together reflect the gospel that unites us? Does anyone want to join in with the songs that we're singing? As believers, as the believers in Acts were knit together in this new community so remarkably, this naturally found expression in the way that they lived. And this passage reveals that this was shown in their views towards their possessions. The passage says no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. When it says they had everything in common, that's basically like saying they considered everything they had to be at the disposal of the community. Why on earth would people say this? That sounds crazy. Well, first, uh, using economic terms, which is how I'm kind of framing this whole thing, it's important to note that this was not some form of Christian communism. Instead, it was a, a voluntary expression of their faith through their material practices. People still technically and legally owned stuff. We'll see this in later passages in Acts if you pay attention to the phrasing. People still, they, were, they owned things. But their attitudes reflected their unity. Their attitudes reflected what they believed. They held everything loosely for the benefit of their brothers and sisters. People had property and saw the need uh, among them and chose to make those funds available, to sell what they had, to make funds available for the people who needed. There's a difference then between saying the church claimed ownership of everything, and they had everything in common. However, that should not lessen our yearning to follow the disciples' lead in at least holding our possessions with a little bit of a looser grip, considering the people around us. As you hear the descriptions of believers offering up their possessions for the sake of others in their community, my question for you is simply one 
of self-reflection. And I'm going to give us a question for each one of the, the points in today's sermon. So maybe write this down if you're taking notes and if you want to consider this even later this week, uh, remembering back to this passage. But the question I have for us with this first point, uh, all of us, myself included, is simply this. What things do you have that would be hardest to give up for the benefit of someone else? What things do you have that would be hardest to give up for the benefit of someone else? When I describe people giving up all that they had in order to support the poor in their community, what makes your heart rate quicken? What is the thing or things that would be hardest to part with? And more importantly, the question we're really getting at is, why do you think that is? I don't think it's wrong to enjoy the stuff we have. Don't get me wrong. I think God blesses people with material and immaterial things all the time. But it can tell us a lot about the state of our hearts when we recognize those things that we're maybe holding on to a little too tightly, or maybe the things we spend a little too much time or money on. I love how a New Testament scholar N.T. Wright puts it when writing about this passage. And, uh, you know, I know sometimes uh, we hear uh, a New Testament scholar or a biblical scholar's name and we think about uh, all of the things that they say. If, if N.T. Wright is, if you're not a fan of N.T. Wright, this quote really for me was just something that helped me frame the whole passage uh, in a really helpful way. And I just hope we can all look at that together. He says, what you do with money and possessions declares loudly what sort of a community you are. And the statement made by the early church's practice was clear and definite. No wonder, then, they were able to give such powerful testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. This passage shows us that the early church valued one another more than any of the stuff they owned. Investing in one another in the church means seeing the incredible value in your brothers and sisters. It means getting to know the people around you, investing in them, supporting them, and building one another up in love, praying for one another when we know uh, what's going on in each other's lives. It means turning your belief into action. May the Holy Spirit empower us to be a community where this is true that we value each other supremely more than any of the stuff that we own. The second point, if you're following along, is the believers found true worth, true worth in Christ. Verse 33 shows us this. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now this point makes sense of the previous point. It is because the believers found true worth in Christ that they radically shifted their understanding of their possessions. The gospel changes everything. It is the center of this story and what makes it all make sense. This verse tells us that the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus to others and two things were evident in them. Great power and great grace. As for great power, the Holy Spirit, evident throughout so much of Acts, can be seen in this text even without being explicitly mentioned in the verses we're talking about today. We don't have to be expressly told the source of the power that transformed these ordinary people into such an amazing new community. It's just apparent uh, from the way they treated each other. And as for great grace, we see that God was providing for his people, that he was making a way for them to be able to bear witness to their community during this time. Great grace was upon them as they shared the gospel. And, you know, I know it can be easy to look at a verse like this and think, oh, cool, they were, they were doing what we would expect, right? The apostles talked about Jesus. That's great, but... Why is it mentioned right in the middle of this passage? But it actually makes total sense of everything on either side of it. On either side of this verse, Luke tells us the actions of the believers in relation to one another and their possessions. And right at the center of that description 
He reminds us of the why they were so radically changed. Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, is King and Lord over all and has invited each of us to follow him with our lives. The one who is the fulfillment of the story of Israel, the story of Scripture, the story of the world and all creation, beckons you and me to join in that good news. God has a purpose for it all. The gospel tells us that we get to be a part of that purpose. And in this gospel, we find true meaning and true worth. It is priceless. I asked you earlier to do a little bit of self-examination, so I want to do it again for this point. And the question I have here is, do your actions reflect Christ's worth in your lives? Do your actions reflect Christ's worth in your life? In this verse, uh, the Greek verbs used to describe the apostles' actions reflect an ongoing nature, basically meaning this wasn't a one-time thing, but they were just continuously telling people that Jesus had defeated the grave. They were continuously declaring Christ's reign as their Messiah King to the people around them. What are we doing continuously? How does your life bear witness to Jesus, to the gospel that changed everything for you? That earlier phrase, uh, the believers had everything in common, you know, it does uh, really mean uh, that they had all of their things in kind of a common share. But I think that this morning we can also just learn something from kind of the basic English reading of that phrase, you know, they had everything in common. And what I mean by that is just that because they had Jesus, ultimately, they had everything that mattered in common with each other. They had been saved and changed by Christ our King. Sadly, the church, and I'm talking about the church universal right here, the church can often get so caught up in our differences that we can bring shame upon the glorious truth that unites us. May it not be so among us, though. May we repent of the ways we've neglected the gospel that unites us by simply just defining people by uh, whether they're us or them, the ways that differentiate us from them. May we instead point one another always back to the one who unites us, who invites us into his love. And finally, may our economy be motivated by sacrificial love. The believer's economy here in Acts was motivated by sacrificial love. In verse 34 we read, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, remember that this is an echo of Deuteronomy 15. There were to be no poor among the people of God. Here, this new community is pursuing the heart of God by shaping their finances around that very concept. Their economy was one that was motivated by sacrificial love for each other. Once again, you know, the, the verbs here, uh, again, indicate like continuous action. The NIV translates this by adding uh, the phrase, from time to time at the beginning of verse 34, which helps to just remind us that Basically, any time the church was seeing a need, they were figuring out how to fill it. It wasn't just a one-time thing right there. The action of laying something at someone's feet was understood uh, in this culture to be a form of just total submission. People were submitting to one another out of love, following the example of the one who had laid down his very life for them. And here is maybe where we uh, in kind of our modern American context, might have the hardest time with this text, I think. Uh, very often we can categorize our lives into the things that are spiritual, you know, kind of religious things, and then the things that are not, that are not a part of that category. You know, it can look like going to church. That's spiritual, right? Going to lunch after church? 
I guess that's more of like a physical thing that, you know, a physical need, right? Reading your Bible, that's a spiritual thing, right? Reading the news, that's definitely something else. Giving money to your church, spiritual. Giving money to Starbucks, maybe essential for people who are in pumpkin spice season right now. Amen. <laughs> it's easy to put things into different categories like that, you know, and I'm kind of making a joke out of it, but it can be easy to think that um, even just Sunday morning, the things that happen here between like 10 a.m. and 11.15 or 11.30 if the sermon goes long. I won't today, by the way. <laughs> but those things can be easy to think of as separate from the rest of the week. But how, do, how we choose to live in every category is directly related to our faith. The way we live and the actions we take bear witness to what we believe. Our works, in other words, reveal our faith. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, it says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. The passage in Acts clearly shows this correlation at work. Just as the believers were giving powerful testimony to Jesus as their Messiah King through their words, so they were proclaiming his reign through their actions and their sacrificial love for the poor in their midst. David Platt, in his book Radical, puts it well while talking about uh, the Christians, the early church, and their example for us, he says, while caring for the poor is not the basis of our salvation, this does not mean that our use of wealth is totally disconnected from our salvation. Indeed, caring for the poor, among other things, is evidence of our salvation. The faith in Christ that saves us from our sins involves an internal transformation that has external implications. If there is no sign of caring for the poor in our lives, then there is reason to at least question whether Christ is in our hearts. Now, honestly, I am super humbled uh, doing any of this message this morning, uh, presenting any of this, but I'm especially humbled in reading Platt's words there. And while I can't pretend to have the right answer about what each one of us is supposed to do with the resources at our disposal, and I think that is supposed to be um, different for each person, I think he's absolutely right in saying that an essential part of the Christian walk is to have a heart that is oriented towards helping others in need. A heart changed by Christ is a heart that is looking outward, the hearts of the believers in Acts were so evidently changed by Jesus' work in their lives that they laid down the things that they had every right to keep to themselves for the good of the new members of their family. And we can never lose sight of the fact that Christ has made us a family. So the final question of self-examination I have for us today is simply, what is your heart oriented towards? What is your heart oriented towards? In verses 36 and 37, we're introduced to Joseph, whom the disciples nicknamed Barnabas. He'll become an important figure in Acts as we continue on, but here he seems to be primarily introduced as a positive example of what was occurring among these believers. It says, Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, that's a great nickname, right? A Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Luke has already said that the believers were doing this, so why does he single out Joseph Barnabas? 
Well, next week, we'll kind of get the continuation of this story uh, in which we'll be introduced to a couple of people who seem to be the kind of other end of the spectrum, the negative examples in this community, who introduce sinful practices as opposed to, you know, sacrificial love as he is displaying. But regardless, Joseph Barnabas in this passage is written about in these verses in the Bible, because his heart was oriented in submission to Christ. This he embodied by laying what he had at the apostles' feet. He surrendered himself and what he had to the will of God. Is our love for Christ, our faith in him, strong enough to surrender all that we have to him? Can we honestly pray, all to Jesus, I surrender All to him I freely give. There's a song by one of my favorite songwriters, John Trost, that succinctly describes what I mean here. The chorus goes, I don't want to buy what I don't need, and I don't want to own what I can't keep. And if I'm going to have to leave it all behind, was it ever really mine? That's a phrase that I like to try to remember when it comes to the things I own, or the money in my bank account. You know, was any of this ever really mine? And at one level, yes. Yeah, totally. Like, I am in charge of the things that are at my disposal. I am to be a good steward and to utilize the resources I have. I'm responsible for that. But bigger than this, is the reality that the one who created me, who gives meaning and worth to life itself, conquered death and invites me into life, and he owns it all. While this stuff happens to be labeled mine today, I ought to be constantly asking God how he wants it to be used for his kingdom. As we kind of transition in today's service to uh, singing together again and looking forward to taking communion together, I want to invite you to just take some time to reflect. What do you need to surrender to him today? What have you been holding a little too tightly that distracts your heart? And finally, God, how can I more faithfully serve you in the things I have today? How can I make your gospel known through my words and my actions today? Let's start by praying together. Would you join me? Lord, as we come before you, as we respond uh, even to your words together, Lord, we're, we're singing those words that I already just mentioned. It can be so hard to say. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. And Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts right now, that you would help us to see the ways that we can uh, be more fully in submission to you with what we have. Lord, I pray that you would speak to each one of us in the ways we need to hear this morning, that you would encourage us, that you would convict us, that you would uh, help us to see uh, what you would want us to do as a response to your love and your work in our lives. Lord, we are so thankful for you. Jesus, we look to you now in this song. Lord, help us to pray this prayer sincerely and to continue to be shaped and molded by you. Lord, we love you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.